the conclusion we come to is that the nature of the underlying does have an effect on the derivatives market and you cannot regard derivatives uh, generically as derivatives and assume that they behave in the same way irrespective of the underlying that they represent. So, uh, for example, one key difference is whether the underlying has an active spot market of its own and exists uh, in a tangible sense such as commodity futures where there are commodities and there are spot markets in those commodities which would exist even without the derivative. And then you, uh, the same is true of equities as well. Although when it comes to index equities, you have an index which doesn't have a spot. You cannot buy the BSC index or the Sensex. You can only buy the constituent shares in the index. You cannot actually buy the underlying itself. When, it, when you have these notional underlines, the regulatory challenges are somewhat different. Uh, and again, the challenges are different if you have a commodity versus a financial instrument because in commodities, you have the issue of physical stocks, whether they exist or not. You're not actually trading a piece of paper. The piece of paper represents a real stock. In the case of equities, the paper or the book entry is the asset itself. And so from a regulatory point of view, there are differences. And as we've seen with the manipulation of LIBOR <coughs> or the manipulation of certain other financial indices, the regulatory risks when your underlying is itself subject to uh, is actually something that's decided by a group of bankers sitting in a room and is not openly traded. And then you have a derivative that uses LIBOR as a reference point. There are, uh, there are differences. So it, there is a, and we do find that it's not a generic uh, treatment of derivatives across the board. I can take 10 rupees and incur a liability of 100 rupees much more easily in a derivatives market. Whereas in a spot market with 10 rupees, I would typically lose 10 rupees. But here, I, the leverage is one differentiating factor. The second is particularly for the complex derivatives, not so much for the simpler ones like very straightforward commodity forwards or futures and so on, but for the more complex derivatives, particularly, uh, you know, barrier options or swaps. Uh, there, there are lots of these very complex derivatives. The complexity, and this is the point that uh, I think Anant was very really responsible for bringing out in the book, is the, the very absence of transparency means that you understand your risks much less in these derivative markets than in the underlying markets. And that means, again, that from a regulatory perspective, the chance of things going wrong, not because people took the wrong decision, but because they didn't understand what decision they were taking, is quite uh, serious. I think <clears throat> the, the leverage part of it is uh, clearly the central explanation. But then the, the, the spot market, too, can have leverage. You can buy a margin. But there, I think the leverage decision is more conscious. Here, it happens rather unconsciously. You are not aware how much of uh, leverage and the trading on the margin you are getting into. That is one. Second, of course, we all know that the assumptions that go behind the pricing of derivatives, normal distribution, etc. We know that now, based on the way financial market prices have behaved, they don't confer to the normal distribution. So, to that extent, I think when, when investors take a bet using derivatives, they expect a certain pattern of behavior to the derivative prices based on the spot prices, how the spot prices would evolve and therefore how the derivative prices would evolve. But because the derivatives markets don't conform to those assumptions, they are surprised by the manner in which these prices swing and usually get caught out and they are forced to liquidate and then top up their margins, etc. and then incur therefore heavy really cash losses. So the two, two factors that make it much more complex are the unconscious leverage that people get into it and the fact that the underlying assumptions that go into their pricing are usually not met in practice. Those two are the added dimensions uh, that make it much more difficult. Yeah. Just to add to that, yeah. as he says, the unconscious leverage is the key. But in countries like India, typically for equities, it is not easy to get leverage except through derivatives. Whereas in the US, you can actually do margin trading without a derivatives account. You'll be able to get margin from your broker, but in the Indian circumstances, the derivatives actually offer sometimes the only way to get leverage on your security. Uh, secondly, again, to follow up on the point on the complexity, many certain kinds of derivatives, not necessarily futures or market traded options, can only be priced through models. They don't have an alternative pricing mechanism except the use of a computerized model which sits on the desk of pricing specialists in investment banks. 
and we have a chapter in the book where we look at how sometimes it is pricing by model and not pricing by market and to the extent the model is wrong the price is inherently wrong and yet everyone takes that as the market price because everyone is using the same model so in a sense you are saying that when you are pricing by model you have a derivative which doesn't have an underlying you don't know the underlying price and therefore you are using some mathematical formula and say this is the price an underlying price and a thriving underlying market is the advantage that it's not any formula, but it is actual buyers and sellers who are giving out the price signals about what they are comfortable at trading, at what price they are comfortable at trading. The point about leverage that you bring out um, goes back to my experience. I joined SEBI in 2008 uh, February as uh, chairman and uh, the financial crisis was kind of uh, slowly uh, beginning to make its uh, presence felt. Some people thought that we are going to get out of this problem. It was only seen as a problem, not as a crisis. And some people thought that, no, there was something serious uh, coming in there. And uh, one of the things that I remember investors often repeated to us as a complaint was that, sir, I wanted to invest in, let's say, State Bank of India. And I said, this is def this stock is definitely going to go up. So my broker said that with the money that you have, say 5 lakhs of rupees, why do you want to buy State Bank of India shares? Why don't you invest in State Bank, in, State Bank of India futures? So he says, but what will happen if I do that? So he says, look, if the State Bank of India stock goes up by 10 rupees, in futures you will make so much money, which is about 10 times. Whereas uh, if you buy a State Bank of India shares, then you are going to make only so much money, one tenth of that number. So here is a great opportunity. And here is where I think uh, the other point that they brought out about the leverage not only being there, it being hidden. So what typically happens is that the market intermediary told, tells him only this part of the story. He doesn't tell him if the stock goes down by 10%, what happens? Your entire money will get wiped out. So typically the complaint from the investors used to be that, sir, if I had invested in State Bank of India and if it had lost 10%, I would have got my 90% back. Now my broker says there is nothing, no money left at all. How did that happen? State Bank of India value has not become zero. I invested in State Bank of India. Why has my money become zero? So because there was leverage present there. And that brings me uh, to, since you also mentioned regulation, that it appeared to me at least uh, from the limited perspective of uh, regulating capital markets that uh, this race between regulators and uh, market intermediaries, market players is on many counts. Uh, one of them is that as regulators we are trying to see that the market does not leverage itself too much. Individuals in the market do not leverage themselves too much. And when the times are booming, the intermediaries as well as the actual investors feel that this is an unnecessary regulation because I can make 10 times the profit if I am allowed 10 times leverage. I can make 100 times the profit if I am allowed 100% leverage. So why are you guys who don't participate in the market coming in and telling me that 100% leverage is bad for you? 100 times leverage is bad for you. Why, why are you saying that? Let me decide for myself. And thereby hangs the tale of the 2008 crisis that we discovered that in the so-called advanced world with advanced regulation and so on, the biggest intermediaries were operating at 30 to 40 times leverage. And if you go to a common trader, a Kirana shop owner, he will tell you that 30 times leverage is devastating. It will kill you. Because 30 times leverage simply means that if my underlying asset goes down by 3%, I'm wiped out. No equity left. So, uh, leverage and hidden leverage seems to be two important points which the authors have brought out in this book. When as authors you take both positions, yes and no, you can be in the danger of uh, being people who don't have an opinion. You are saying, yes, this is also true, that is also true. <laughs> did you actually uh, find this difficulty and how did you handle it? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess this is a process of evolution. That is, so it's not 
complete with the book writing itself. It continues. Your your own learning continues, and uh, so uh, we don't want to give out the message that derivatives by themselves should not be touched. Because if, for example, a client or investor goes long a call option or <coughs> long a put option, from day one he or she knows what they're going to lose: the maximum downside. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, that could be as safe as buying a stock or a bond. Because once you know what your downside is on day one, it is as uh, safe or as unsafe an instrument in the financial markets as any other instrument can be. So the important thing is for you to understand the downside of what you are getting into. And if you understand it, then derivatives are as good or as bad as any instrument. Therefore, there is no particular case for you to say derivatives per se or bad. So that is why we didn't want to take the extreme position then it should be bad. Ultimately, it's about understanding the risks that you are getting into. And if you don't understand it, don't touch it. Uh, and and from the from the policy makers' point of view, we wanted to send out the message that there are many issues that are well beyond the assumptions that are made in a, in a theoretical setting. And the actual financial market participants' behavior also influences a great deal. The risks that come with derivatives. So it is not the instrument per se. But the way the financial uh, intermediaries uh, use that, or rather exploit that, or the client's lack of understanding by using terminology that is confusing, etc. So I think there we haven't pulled our punches. But in a, from a conceptual framework on derivatives per se, we didn't want to take a, uh, an extreme stance. Yeah. Just to supplement that. I mean, this holding of two contradictory positions in your head at the same time and trying to synthesize comes naturally to a civil servant. <laughs> so perhaps I found it a little easier to... <laughs> I think it was a good balance because he had a clear view. I originally had a clear view on the opposite side. I ended up coming in, the, in between. He said in certain cases we are very forthright about what should be. For instance, we do say that you, you should not have credit default swaps without an issue. You should not be able to take an insurance policy on something and then want that risk to materialize, which is what CDS, and we've given a case study in the book of where Morgan Stanley had a CDS with, Kazakh, with a bank in Kazakhstan and actually wanted the Kazakhstan bank to default because what they could get from the CDS was more than what they could get on the loan. <laughs> so because that is what happens when you, you can take out an instrument without an interest. So even in a normal insurance policy, I can't insure your house because then I might want to burn it down so that I can collect on it. Here on a differential approach to different markets, and that is what we are really trying to say is, for instance, the social benefit cost ratio of a particular derivatives market would vary inversely with its complexity. So the more complex, the higher the cost versus the benefits, and the more careful one should be from the regulatory point. Uh, it varies inversely with systemic risk. The greater the systemic risk, the greater the cost, and perhaps those derivatives should be watched very carefully. It varies directly with the macroeconomic importance of hedging. So, for instance, if you look at derivatives in foreign exchange, I don't think the economy can work without them. I mean, I need to hedge my foreign currency risk as an importer, as an exporter, as a borrower of capital, as a lender of capital. And without foreign exchange forwards, it's a very simple, effective kind of derivative. You wouldn't be, you, your import-export trade would be very complicated. So, it varies directly with macroeconomic importance of hedging. And... Finally, it varies indeterminately with the importance of the underlying to the poor. I mean, if the underlying is wheat, rice, tor dal, urad dal, frankly, the conclusion in our book, after reviewing a very voluminous literature, is that nobody knows whether these things cause inflation or not. The empirical evidence suggests that in certain circumstances, derivatives markets do inflate prices beyond what would have happened without the derivatives. And in certain circumstances, as might have happened recently with oil, they push it down more rapidly than it would happen without derivatives. So, in that case, we can't be very certain. And the only truth that policymakers can learn is that there is uncertainty and don't trust the economists completely because they don't know. <laughs> sure, the nature of this distinction between exchange trader and OTC. OTC should be deployed in situations where you don't find the instrument and exchange. So, it should be a special circumstance situation. So the whole idea is to customize the solution. And usually, you would expect the 80 20 mix to happen. 80% will be available through ready-made solutions and 20% or 10% whatever you resort to specific tailor-made solutions. But what has happened in some of these cases, it's the other way around. The exchange traded derivatives form a very small portion of it, or even none at all. And everything happens in the OTC market. So to that extent, I think uh, uh, the, the buyer, and that is clearly asymmetric information.
connection between the sellers of these products and the buyers. So the buyers are a disadvantage. And as a regulator, I think if you do not know the volumes and the kind of risk that people are taking, and we all know that in finance, contagion is a very, very big concern, which is not the case in other industries. If company A fails, company B, C and D actually benefit. But uh, if bank A fails, then bank B, C and D come under uh, vulnerable. So I think the OTC derivatives, therefore, uh, to the extent that their volumes are very high multiples of exchange traded derivatives, I think pose an important risk to systemic stability. So from that point of view, I think we want to, we would like to see more of it coming to the exchange traded uh, segment, so where it is easy to see the volumes, where it is easy to see the positions and therefore what kind of bets are being built up. And more importantly, if you want derivatives to play a role in the price discovery process, it is better if it is available through the exchange contract rather than through OTC contracts. So that's, uh, that's my take on it. Add there. One of the suggestions made in this book for OTC derivatives is that since ideally they should be used only for customized solutions, not for standard solutions that are available. Often. It was misused in the United States. OTC was actually the swap market was effectively an exchange traded market that pretended to be an OTC market so that it did not have to be regulated. Because if it was exchange traded, there were regulations. If they called it OTC, it was deregulated. So it was called OTC and therefore Credit insurance was called credit swap, and there's a whole history behind how this was uh, evolved. But the key thing is, if it is customized, then what we suggest here is that there must be restrictions on third-party sales. So if I need a very customized solution for my company because I have a particular risk profile, then fine, take that. But don't let, let either me or the other party freely market that to others who don't have that customized risk. And then set up a regulatory system where OTC is genuinely for customized solution. And don't prevent the customized solution, but don't make it a backdoor entry into uh, a, a thing that is actually meant for wider services. Things uh, that we found in the Indian market, and you must remember this instance uh, yourself as well, is that um, the complexity of derivative instruments is used sometimes by the financial intermediary to um, not tell you the full story while that derivative is being sold to you. So it's not just leverage, but what is it that you are exactly doing? And uh, let me go back again to the uh, time around which the financial crisis uh, erupted. <coughs> we didn't have uh, the kind of problems that uh, uh, US or the London market had, but we had a whole host of companies who had been sold derivatives by the banks and suddenly the companies found that uh, there were huge losses on those positions. And then they discovered that the derivatives that had been sold to them were, uh, for example, a risk on Swiss franc, when the company had nothing to do with the Swiss franc. It was exporting to the US or it was importing from US, its exposure was to dollar or to yen, and he had been given a derivative on Swiss franc. And the company said that, look, we were cheated. And the Reserve Bank of India has very clear guidelines that banks must explain properly to their clients what the derivative is all about. And since this was sold against the instructions of the Reserve Bank of India, the losses should be taken by the banks. And the banks argued that you are not some small investor who has only thousand rupees to invest. You are educated corporate guys. Are you now when you make losses, are you trying to tell us that uh, we didn't understand the derivatives. Um, interestingly, we made some informal inquiries. We had uh, nothing directly to do with this, but we thought since we supervised the equity derivatives, there might be some lessons for us. So, one of the questions that uh, we asked people was, that if they have made losses today, there must have been some point of time at which they might have made gains as well. <laughs> and when somebody, the CFO of the company went to the audit committee or the risk committee and told them that I have hedged this position and I am making money on it. Didn't somebody ask him that if you take insurance against some asset, you never make money on that contract. You pay an insurance premium. I never heard of somebody taking an insurance on his car and saying I made money on this. <laughs> so, if you are making money, there is something more than just hedging that is happening here. And uh, to our horror, we found uh, two kinds of answers. 
One is that some people sheepishly accepted that they always knew that there was a bet here. And now that the bet has gone wrong, they are being pushed by their legal departments to argue that the banks have missold. And there were people who genuinely didn't understand. So that's uh, uh, the complexity of derivatives being sometimes used by financial intermediaries to not tell you the full story. <coughs> sometimes you understand the full story, but you don't want to admit losses. So this can be one of the consequences. India has interestingly the experience of both uh, types. We had a complete ban on derivatives on equities by law till about 1998 or 2000. So from the days of independence till then there was a complete ban. And I went to CB for the first time in 1992. I was still in the administrative service. I went on deputation. Uh, Mr. Ramakrishna was the chairman. And uh, I didn't know anything about stock markets. So I went to Bombay Stock Exchange, asked various people various things and all. Then I was told that, sir, there is a ban on futures and options. But there is one guy here who sits outside the stock exchange after 5 o'clock. After all, the trading is over and all. And all brokers go to him. His name was Fatak. And they hedge their positions with him. And this guy is like a computer. He keeps all those positions, he settles everything on time, and he's fantastic. So then I sent a message to Mr. Fatak. I said, look, I want to understand what is it that you do and why are you so popular? So his reply was very interesting. He replied back saying, sir, you sit in SEBI, and this is an illegal activity. So I will come and meet you. But I will meet you after office hours. <laughs> During office hours, I cannot discuss an illegal activity with you. I met him, phenomenal man, very good understanding. But the message that I took was that there is some genuine need here for derivatives. Otherwise, if they are banned, this is just one man. You don't know whether he will settle or he will not settle. Why would brokers take positions with him? So there was some genuine need which we were ignoring through a ban. And bans clearly don't work. We have a chapter on, we broadened it out to say, what about finance and its role in economic development? Because after all, derivatives are part of finance. And we have a chapter on it where we analyze the literature that has evolved over the years on how much of use that finance is when it comes to economic development. Clearly, nobody will say finance is unimportant because it is a linchpin of all investing and risk taking etc. But I think increasingly we have studies that show as with most things in life there is a golden mean beyond which there is a law of diminishing return that sets in and I think that is what we have brought out. So the answer is there are there is literature not necessarily specifically with respect to derivatives and economic growth but finance, financial innovation and financial intermediation and economic growth and development. I think that is an evolving literature, but to the extent that whatever we could uh, get hold of until the time we went to print, we have analyzed it, we have looked at it, and we say that, yes, it, is, uh, it has got a role, but do not overstate the role it plays in, a, in aiding economic development, because beyond a certain point, you can have a completely financialized economy, which is actually going to be rather destabilizing. There are two kinds of, I mean, one, there are irrational people. Two, there are people who are rational until the age of 40 and then become irrational. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so there are, there is it's somehow human, and that is something we refer to here. Not everyone is motivated by the same things. And I think at certain points of time, people make career choices which have long-term impacts. And you can't reverse or flip. And uh, those legacy impacts, it's a very complex story of why people end up where they are. But... I know it's a question that people say, but can you attract good talent into regulatory agencies? This is a question that both the RBI, SAB, you know, all regulators have faced. It, my own take on this, having been in the World Bank and, you know, have, 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 and looked at it from the government side, is that actually getting good talent at government salaries is not impossible. In fact, there are people that are willing to come, especially people at a mature stage of their career who have, if you like, made their money and are now looking to do something socially productive. It's a, uh, so talent is not really a problem in that regulatory equation. It is more a question of is the regulation independent or is the, uh, is the regulator intellectually captured by the regulator, not necessarily financially captured. There is sometimes 
the blatant bribery and that's a different kind of capture. But I'm referring to intellectual capture where all that you hear comes from one particular side because regulated agencies typically have a particular agenda. You're regulating in favor of the general public who usually doesn't interact with you because they're not organized and they're disorganized. And so the brokers are organized, the banks are organized, the insurance companies are organized, but the insurance policy holder doesn't really come to you very often. So the key task for the regulator really is that intellectual challenge. How do we see the other point of view that's not being advocated before us? Human capital, I think that is a real issue. Well, it is true that people will uh, work for you uh, out of uh, good social uh, uh, objectives in their minds, but uh, at the end of the day, one can't say that the kind of compensation that is given is irrelevant. But it is also a reality that there is no way, no way, regulators can pay the kind of salaries that are paid in the market. Economic incentives are different. And don't take me wrong, but just look at it from this perspective. What are the economic incentives of a person who is trying to invent a lock and the economic incentives of a person who is trying to invent a key which will open the lock? You know, this guy who is trying to invent the key has immediate returns. The first house he breaks in, he will get a return on whatever efforts he has spent on that key. This lock guy must do all the research, invent this lock, then convince people that this is a very good lock, sell it in sufficient numbers in order to be able to get his return. So, we have to assume that market players will always be three steps ahead of the regulator. There is no question about it. Uh, somebody mentioned Mr. Ramakrishna and the biggest thing I learned from him, I worked twice uh, under him, was that uh, knowledge comes out of your admission that I don't know. And the reason why SAB had a steep uh, or rather a quick learning curve was that we were very clear that we didn't know. We didn't know how the market operated and we needed to learn. Does anyone know? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But you don't know as much as the market players do. The market players will always be ahead of you. And all market players are not bad. It's not a dirty word. I mean, they are also there for a living and everybody doesn't make a living by thieving. People make a living through honest means as well. So if you consult enough of them, you will get good advice at the end of the day, like you pointed out. And there will be some people who will support uh, what you are doing. I think if those two things are kept in mind, one can solve this uh, issue of... Uh, so to my mind, more than uh, trying to find people who are socially oriented, it's uh, a difficult job. Uh, the point is, uh, if we can inculcate some humility amongst uh, regulators, and humility when you sit in a seat of power is a very difficult thing. <laughs> very difficult, uh, because uh, that seat gives you so much <laughs> that you start uh, thinking that you know everything. I think if we do that, we will uh, go a long way. The other point you made, and that is an equally contentious issue, that uh, there are people who say that, okay, I want to give five years of my life for doing this. I may not take up a regulated job as a permanent job because I don't think that pays enough, but I'm prepared to give. One has to be cautious because it can also result in revolving door, which is an issue in the US where the capital market players are coming in and then they are giving self-serving advice. So one has to be cautious, but that is one thing that uh, can be tried and we should uh, be able to get good people who are prepared to come and devote a part of their life. It's easy to be critical in hindsight of the repeal of glass -Steagall. And one important thing which we hope we have brought out is ultimately economic policy making as well as individual decision making is about empirical experimentation. Fine, there was a certain feeling, again without going into the forms of capture that might have played a role, intellectually they might have thought that repealing glass and repealing these artificial barriers would be useful, economies of scale, etc, etc, fine. And so let's give them the benefit of doubt and it was done with that motive. But as the evidence starts accumulating that it is not fulfilling its purpose or put it differently, the costs are beginning to exceed the benefits, then you should be open-minded about enough to, to go back. So going back is not exactly regression. It could be also a sign of open-mindedness. So I think uh, what the evidence has shown is that now in hindsight that the repeal of Blast Eagle ended up creating more costs than benefits for the system as a whole not necessarily the international industry. So, I think therefore the, the, the answer is clear that if you want to look at systemic stability and systemic risk factors, 
that maybe there was a certain particular logic in, in having them in separate buckets. But that is, it's, it's okay to have tried it out, but now that we have discovered the cause, then I think it's probably appropriate to rethink whether the repeal was appropriate or not. Originally, the, the, until the Commodity Exchanges Act of 1930 or 33 in the United States, uh, there was this ambiguity was, and in fact, it's been an age-old ambiguity. I mean, a, every futures contract can, and especially if you look at the modern literature where people routinely use the word bet, and we routinely use the word player. Here's a new player in this market. I mean, it, these are words that are very reminiscent of gambling, uh, bets players and so on. So the distinction is actually quite narrow. I mean, it's, it's a very thin line. Um, there's, a, there's a scholar on futures markets called Holbrook Working, who's, if you like, this father of futures trading scholarship. And he, he we've quoted him too. He says the distinction is whether there is a public purpose behind the gambling. And if the gambling achieves a public purpose beyond the immediate gain and loss to the two people involved, then it is desirable speculation. Otherwise, it is gambling. That's a, I'm being oversimplistic. There are more uh, things to it. But in a sense, therefore, <coughs> raison d'etre of any derivatives market has to be that larger public purpose. Otherwise, even in the US, CDS would have been illegal right. if it hadn't been defined as a derivative. And therefore, they went to a great length to make it a derivative contract and then take it out of the CFTC's regulation. Because if it was a, the legal position in the US is, in general, derivatives are illegal because they are gambling. However, if it is a regulated derivative under the CFTC or the SEC, then it is not gambling. This is the essence of the US position, very similar to Indonesia in the basic principle, except that they had a more sophisticated law which said it is gambling, but if it falls in this, it is not gambling. And then came the CFMA of 2000, which of course wiped away everything and said nothing is gambling. All derivatives are uh, totally non-gambles. And then you had the 2008 crisis that followed. On the equity side, uh, we regulated them by just banning them. <laughs> so, till about uh, this century, derivatives were banned in Indian markets. Um, subsequently, it has been opened, but not opened uh, fully. So, what the provision of the Act says is that only those derivatives that are traded under the regulation of SEBI are legal. Otherwise, it is illegal. So, for two, any two individuals to enter into a futures contract on any stock or an options contract is illegal. But if they came to an exchange which was regulated by CP and CP had permitted that uh, particular product, that would be legal. That is the legal position. I think uh, if my instinct is right, uh, then probably we will stay here for a considerable period of time. Because uh, this uh, partial opening has uh, helped us a lot in terms of uh, developing this market, not just in terms of the volumes that the market has attracted, but in terms of our ability to be able to uh, put a risk containment mechanism <coughs> that at the end of the uh, day when settlement takes place, there is no default. Um, Modern technology has helped tremendously because what exchanges do now is that your margin variation is calculated on an online basis. So any moment that the total position of the broker is not justified by the margin he has with the exchange, his terminal simply gets switched off. And after that, the only thing he is permitted to do is to bring down those positions. He is not allowed to increase his exposure to the market unless he is able to bring in additional margins. So technology has been extremely helpful and uh, it's been a very happy experience in terms of settlement. <coughs> All settlements have gone through on time, on schedule, without a default.